Okay, here's an interesting artifact that has its own mystique with it. This is known as the Gabel Arok knife. And uh, we're going to go kind of into depth on this. But before we even do, there's a few different pictures which are real good. Uh, and I've done a previous video about this and also in the series that I did um, about pre-dynastic Egypt and uh, its formations. I put this information in there too. Uh, but I didn't have this good picture here too. But also this is kind of a verifier video if you will. And uh, it's kind of neat where you get to go, instead of talking about what Pharaoh did what and all this type of stuff, we get to go back thousand years before the pyramids were built in pre, pre dynastic Egypt times and also it has a flare of Indiana Jones in it because that's kind of the time scheme and things and stuff that would have been going along if you want to you know take reality for fact versus perhaps a movie presentation this is something along the line of an Indiana Jones type artifact that would have been found that means so much and it's not the golden head tiki idol or even the Ark of the Covenant but it does show some things that go along with all of that kind of so let's get into this a little bit for if we take a look at this I I know it's very small, and so people could say, well, it's real small, so representations could be off. But whenever you blow this thing up, after having taken it with some Google Max Pixel camera and getting a real good focus shot and blowing it up real good, you get to take a better look at it. And you'll see these lions, and it's not a common representation of a lion. One thing that people noted right off the bat, let me see if I get my pointer here, is that they have this extra from from just having their normal mane they have this extra that runs here it runs here now that's seen in Sumerian art but it's also kind of the Barbary lion what they call them and there was a lion that well it's still the extant today they think and in fact in one of my videos I showed a small clip of one that they saw down in some valley way more west of Libya and uh, it, they thought of it to be a Barbary lion now in captivity there are lions that are Barbary lions but it's believed that they are none of those are even purebred even though they had a whole series of them that were after introducing other lions that weren't and to help out their gene pools in some way they've thinned it down in a way but this is the type of lion that would have been all the way through Samaria and way up in Anatolia and a lot for ancient days and I've also talked about the ancient prehistoric type lion that seemed to have been non maned or at least in a lot of the cave art that was even north of that and come into North America and the giant one was there everybody talks about the saber-toothed tiger nobody talks about the lion that was gigantic that was in America too at that time but that's different totally different reference and believe me before I started this I went down a rabbit hole and back out somewhere else and peekaboo and thought I knew where I was compared to where I thought and came back in and back out and no I'm not there da 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 and went through a series of things I thought I could say to you about this and let's see how many of them I can get out correctly as we go through this and I say this jokingly I'm gonna try to make this work in one and 45 minute session one thing maybe you could barely see, in fact, I think it's the only picture that really catches it well, is here there are some boats at the bottom of it. We do get a closer look at that somewhat later. And then there's some Sumerian iconography that's in here. This is one side of it that has the blading, and it's usually shown facing everybody. And uh, it has a war scene here, but on the other side is this scene, and of course, what we're looking at is somebody with a full beard versus the little chin beards that are done later and it also has a hat and this is a Sumerian iconography this also sash and everything else and he's clothed fully also here we see something that we would recognize as being a Canaanite type hound 
dogs. But in the fight scene over here, they show people be pretty much naked except for they get this little ding ding holder and the sash around their waist. And it's looking as being somewhat common people. But you can see that's quite well dressed and a little different. And they make a mention of Gudea and the priest kings and things like that. And so it, it, it shows that some of the people knew some things and then later it doesn't come out. So one thing that we'll also talk about and you can see in each of these videos, I think I'll remember it to say it later, but how straight this edge is here versus bananas right here. But this edge is here and then it tips up somewhat. It's a little scimitar shape, but the thing's only like 11 inches long or something, right? Now, how we get this old Indiana Jones thoughts and all that type of it, We I recently did a video where I uh, showed that they had caught something at uh, JFK Airport of somebody smuggling in a bunch of suitcases full of stuff. And uh, now I look back at it, and I hate to look back at my own work because instantly I one of the things that I wanted to say initially never came out. And I went on this rant, and when I top edited it, it cut off the end of it again. It just pisses me off when that happens. But what I left out is the fact that it had made it through Cairo Airport and security, through Heathrow Airport in London, to Jeff Gay, and then it got caught. But this has been get gotten acquired by the black market in ancient times oh you know indiana jones and he comes in and tries to talk to people that are hushy hushy over in the corner wheeler dealer you think of han solo in some shady little cantina trying to find his way to alderaan or something well no well it's indiana jones version of it that's the same kind of concept here and trying to find out who's got the stuff and all that type of thing and these people were doing this back in the day and it didn't seem like it was some customs people trying to bust somebody or something no it was, they were trying to acquire artifacts and uh, mainly for museums I'll just put it that way So let's get into this a little more. One thing that you can see, and I think this is the close representation of it too, that it looks like they've got their feet sitting on the top of a stance or somewhat, and it's believed by some people, and I've heard somebody talk for an hour and a half about this thing, but there used to be a box below this type of thing or something that they would put their uh, feet up on, uh, and so they are in stance up off of it, not just prancing somewhat. If they were, they could easily have something like a you know a, a bent arm in some way and it could just be the representation but you can kind of see it on that side here but you don't necessarily see it I don't know you don't see it but of course they're shaving this off and again this is ivory and they're shaving this off but they're having to leave all these pictures and shave off the background but the background is uniformed and then they've done a type of burnishing as with a special stone these guys go into it, uh, not in here, but these other guys go into it, that you would give it this effect. And that they were doing this back then, and the guys seemed amazed about it, but that has to be the effect that they used after the effect of creating all the bottle of relief. And again, this thing would fit in the palm of your hand, so it's not. this is not some sculpture on the wall type of thing, but it's pretty damn intricate. You think of somebody taking something i've got a little pointer here and i, I don't know how to describe that, the middle of it but actually it's got the it's supposed to be a little drill part a little handled drill part i use it for a pointer um instead of a pin or something and uh if you can't find it you spin they're using something that is like exacto quality but then a set of tools would be required to use this to make this and there was one guy that was a uh person in oriental work was ivory da 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 you know kind of some kind of expert dude on that and he was the one that was marveling on this thing kind of like somewhat after getting some some pictures of it and everything and uh, he thought it was somebody doing some mock-up a little later and i think the only the deal was 
but I don't know about the whole thing is all they did was show him the handle thing and then when they showed him the whole deal and told him what it was that's when he re went you like you know what the hell uh, so this is just came out and so let's make one and I'll try to put it out at ASAP but I've got some cool stuff lined up right now Gebel Erok knife a link to ancient Egypt's distant beginnings the ancient far-reaching civilizations of the world are for many people a continuous source of inspiration ancient ageless myths and wonders of emerging societies and archaic technologies are not only extraordinary but often baffling as well from the megalithic structures of Neolithic Europe to the mysterious Easter Island statues all the way to the ancient Egypt the achievements of ancient man are often difficult to fully grasp as we endlessly explore the countless wonders that emerge from the ancient Egyptian civilization, we come upon many magnificent creations. Ancient items crafted with extreme precision, some ooh parts in there. One such item that is one of the earliest wonders of emerging Egypt is the so-called Gebel Arak knife. A ritual item of a great and elaborate design, this nice knife comes from a very early formative period of what was to become ancient Egypt as we know it today before that it shows us the important early connections of the region and gives us a glimpse into the major events of the period that's a pretty damn good lead-in let's continue discovering the Gebel Arak knife for the pioneering Egyptologist of the 19th and 20th centuries AD the pre-dynastic period of ancient Egypt was often the most puzzling mysterious era of this history a variety of emerging and disappearing cultures muddled cohesion and a lack of defining archaeological finds led to a difficult task of piercing together that puzzle and learning more about the formative years of such a lavish civilization but the discovery of Gebel Arak knife that far-reaching picture would change immensely this is one of those artifacts where you'd say man you know in, in reality it really takes a few things before you're able to take and perhaps take a deduction make a little theory and try to get something out of it if you follow me right well this is one that pretty much just alone does that but then they found more of them and things and there was a confirming thing all along here's another good picture of it and uh, the handle swirls something that looks very reminiscent of a star right here in a cradle and so on and there's when we get to look at the boat you'll see some of the iconography that are in that and it shows things that these guys are willing to talk about now I find it odd but maybe not so that things that I was talking about 20 years ago and everybody would call you a heretic are now somewhat more accepted you almost think it's like like what people said when there was a hippie age they said yeah but wait till all these people grow up and they have kids and uh, that could change the world and the same thing was said coming out of World War two and we can see the glory that came out of that and reaching into space and now we've taken it to so many new levels and I find that these levels that we're looking at here sometimes we get to talk about in reverse during the early 1900s Egyptologists often had to rely on the seedy back alleys of Cairo private antiquity dealers nudge nudge wink wink know what I mean whispered tips and many somewhat shady sources all in hopes of purchasing new and defining relics of ancient Egypt 
in a setting that is largely reminiscent of an exciting Indiana Jones movie. These devoted scholars and archaeologists merged with the Cairo Society and scanned the back uh, black market for items of worth. And so you can kind of see what I was saying before. Well, it can safely be said that many of the ancient Egyptian relics that came from such street vendors of Cairo and elsewhere were looted. Men who recognized the worth of old items always disregarded the magnificence of ancient history, and thus they did not hesitate to go grave robbing and sifting through known ancient locations or ones they would find for items of worth put in a casual stance. During that period, any tourist could have purchased a proper money, mummy of an animal or even a person for the lowest amounts of money imaginable. If I might even make a video about this one time, but it's going to end up turning into a rant, and because I'll become irritated as I go into it worse and worse, but what was done with mummies and parties and things like that and everything's like, well, a lot of those are the mummies we have in museums and so on, and that's great, but a lot of them were like used for fire sometimes and stuff and, and just burn up and, and things that you look at would be just unbelievable. But hell, if you could buy them for cheaper than you could buy firewood, I'm going to take a long deep breath here and just go back into it. Watch some of her stuff, but she seems to be a lady that geared towards certain things and certain times and so on. And even though she has a great aspect of the whole thing, she's, I wouldn't say she's all in the Kool-Aid, but doesn't know the flavor, but she doesn't want to talk about the other thing. I've noticed how they, when we're talking about Egypt, they're still studying this from the Oriental Institute. Sometimes Egypt is se separated. Egyptology is totally separated from that concept. But a lot of people freak out when they find out when you're studying Sumerian things because of its separation from that. Even though you're near Eastern studies, you're studying in Oriental studies. But finding a truth or a truly groundbreaking artifact was often nearly impossible and oh it's the tales of Indiana Jones and all that in a bag of chips right nonetheless one French Egyptologist did find one and that man was George Aaron Benedet one of the leading men in his field probably wore a hat that looks a little Indiana Jones's didn't shave for a couple of days meh I don't know what he looks like in his picture guys we're going in February 1914, he purchased a pristine, highly decorated ivory and flint knife. He discovered it in two different pieces at a Cairo antique dealership owned by a guy named Mr. Naaman. The back alley markets of dusty Cairo and the treasures they kept. Well, Benedict at once recognized that such a lavish item he uh, held significance and knew from the style of its manufacture that it certainly comes from the pre-dynastic period. In fact, it, the man seemed to have recognized quite a bit. We'll talk about that in a minute. The Cairo Antiques dealer didn't recognize the item as a knife, though. He was selling the handle and the blade as two separate pieces of a flint blade type thing and a little carving. The man stated to have discovered the handle part at a location he called Gebel Iraq, a prehistoric plateau that is located roughly 25 miles or 40 kilometers from the important ancient Egyptian city of Abydos. But when he presented Benedet a lot of items, among which was the flint blade, the dealer said he had recently discovered those at Abydos itself. Thus, Benedet was able to conclude that 
the complete knife certainly belonged in Abydos and was discovered probably there, as such a significant item would have no place at the Gebel Arak site. We continue. Here's a good picture. So before we go on, a little more looks at it. The same picture here, but just slightly poking out is this knob or nub that's on here. And there's a drilled hole perfectly through here, and that's what it would have attached a piece of string or leather to attach it to the person on his belt or so on. And there sure should have been a sleeve of some type, which was probably made out of animal leather, perhaps with the fuzzy part to the inside and so on, blah, 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 at this time. Because no one wants that rubbing up against their leg. This thing is razor sharp, pretty much. But... So this side would have been facing inside and the warrior side facing outside. In their pictures here, you can see guys that are fighting with each other. Back and forth, swinging and going. And I think this is the only picture in the bunch, guys, that show these ancient Sumerian reed boats, which they were all recognized. And apparently this man did too at the time. For he realized these symbols and these statu statues here and the crescent and the star and the things that go along with it and the way these boats were a little different was a little different and at this time there was only hints from a couple of finds that might have led someone to think along these lines and yet instantly he seemed to know what he had here Whereas, in a modern day, people try to see any way they can find if they can say that's what, not what they have here. Benedet purchased this item at once from the Paris, for the Paris Louvre Museum. Excited, he immediately wrote about his discovery to the Louvre's head of the Department of Egyptian Antiquities, Charles Burrow. Dated to March 16, 1914, the letter survives to this day, and from the following excerpt, we can understand the weight that the discovery carried at the time. He says, and I quote, The archaic flint knife with an ivory handle of the greatest beauty. This, master, this is the masterpiece of pre-dynastic Egypt. Let's see if I can get through this correctly. This is the masterpiece of pre-dynastic sculpture, apparently found to date for sure. Executed with remarkable finesse and elegance, this is a work of great detail, and the interest of what is represented extends even beyond the artistic value of the artifact. Hmm. Hmm. Pray tell. On one side is a hunting scene, on the other scene of war or a raid. At the top of the hunting scene, the hunter wears a large Chaldean or Sumerian garment. The head is covered by a hat like that of our Gudea, and at the time they had a statue of Gudea. And so people were very much interested in stuff, and they were like, hmm. So he makes the instant connection of ancient Sumerian priest kings and their look and their artistic design. And then the Egyptian things going on here, too. And this is kind of Narmer Paladish and all that stuff. And hmm. Right? And he grasps two lions standing against him. You can judge the importance of this Asiatic representation. We will own one of the world's most important prehistoric monuments, if not more. It is, in definitive, intangible and in summary form, the first chapter of the history of Egypt. And uh, I think that's put a lot of weight on it myself don't you the passion with, with which Benedet writes 
and the acute recognition of the styles and influences presented on the artifact clearly shows us that he and other Egyptologists had a good understanding of the earliest influences on the pre-dynastic period. And though the details and scenes depicted on the knife, we can carry certainty, understand, we can certainly understand a lot more about the era. It should have been coffee instead of just tea this morning, I think. The Gebel Erak knife has a wealth of intricate details. And they tell you that this knife is old, very old, and it is dated to somewhere between 3450 and 3200 BC, predating the construction of the Great Pyramid by almost an entire millennium or a thousand years. In total, the knife is 28 centimeters long or 11 inches and consists of a curved flint blade that is approximately 19 centimeters long or seven and a half inches plus the hilt up inside though and the ivory handle is nine and a half centimeters long or three and point seven inches one glance at the extremely elaborate and rich design tells us this was not a knife to be used in combat but rather a ritual and a significant knife of course ceremonial piece used to be displayed in some way. On one side, the richly carved ivory handle displays apparent hunting scenes filled with animals, while the opposite side shows men in combat and war. And we've kind of gone through that, but here is the hunting scene situation, and this is the Master of Beasts. And it is a Sumerian iconography but the two lions reared up can be seen in a few other places that carry through of ancient civilizations. And in fact, two lions in this representation gets carried all the way. In fact, whenever I heard about this, I was of an age that probably shouldn't be drinking beer, but had a low and brow. If you remember those beers, and they had two lions up on them, and again, and so I'm sitting there and I'm listening to Journey and it's got the winged stun disc on the album cover and doing all this and stuff. And I go, oh my God, this is surrounding us all. And most people have no idea anything about it because they don't study it. And that's so weird. But then again, you know, people that are into other things probably think it's weird that you don't get into it either. But history is something that's kind of interesting because... As long as we get a good grasp of it, it's somewhat real, and it's what led to where we are today. And hey, it's uh, it's the world's greatest movie replayed back in your mind if you go through it through the whole time. So here's these hunting dogs that are being utilized, and they're at bay. But also, if you notice, they already have collars on them. And in fact, if we go down here, and I get off of this thing totally. You see a type of gazelle here with its bent horns here, and then here a different type or a ram with his hair, horns bent back. There's another one that's over here. There's a lion that's right here, though, in the shadow of this knob that's jumping on the back of a cow-looking type object. Oh, okay, well, so there's cattle being introduced, or at least going on here in these people's iconography. And then what we have here is off the edge of this is a man standing. And you can see his feet and part of it's chipped out right here. But he has a cord and it's hooked up to that dog's collar. And he's holding the dog back. Right in front of him is another cow. But we're missing the whole corner right here. And... They could redate this thing with the modern things, but I think they want a little chip off of it, and it's like, just leave it alone till you can do it without the chip. Well, we're just about getting to the point of having a scanner-type situation that they can do, and once they perfect it, all they've got to do is calibrate it, and then all of a sudden we're starting to get those Star Trek things. Of course, it won't be in your phone, but, you know, Star Trek was neat when it had a tricorder because it could do three things. Well, we're going to... We're going to get there in a short period of time. Funny how some things like that drive us to make things like that, to do things like that. Hmm, like lasers and all the other things that we come up with. It just makes it seem like it, once you imagine it, there's an ability. It comes into fruition. 
as long as it's possible. This flint blade, <clears throat> and we're fixing to show you the back of the blade, this is something that's rarely shown. The flint blade was created with the traditional Neolithic flaking method, but with immense precision and attention to detail and its length and the way it rubs down. And you can see it over here on the left, and it gets to be almost a zebra pattern to it, and it's delicately made, but also even at the corner it has these weird Y with a V inside serrations down the edge that were systematically built all the way through it. And this thing is just only six millimeters thick, right? It says it right here, but one side is ripple flake to such immense detail that it has razor sharp edges to it. The other side is just sanded smooth. Now it is surprisingly thin, six millimeters or less than a quarter of an inch thick, right? So this is not something that really could stand up to a bunch of abuse. But once we look down the blade as we do here, you can see a pedaling of it. And then as they make this mark here to turn, it turns much smaller and starts to look almost like leaves in a fern or something like that. You see that, right? It's for a reason somewhat. But let's go back up this thing. I want you to notice that that's this little notch that's right over here that's a chip out of it. Then it's corresponding place on the other side, like you flip the blade around and it's here. There's a chip that takes that space. But also, from there up, until right before the handle, this is extremely straight, extremely straight, right here. Zits. And also, if we look at it on this side, this same effect comes in from about here. It's just straight running for a while. But that's um, the one side. And so after the extremely straight little notch chip, it starts, they step and do a chipping into it and go all the way up here and bend it. And it comes at an angle it, like it would be about this line right here. And they've got it up to there. And then this banana edge comes out, right? But most people don't think about it. But the other side is just perfectly sanded flat. Now, it would have been flaked like this. So they could have done it to both sides and made it look like a steak knife of today where it just has that serrated edge on one edge. And then this is all flat instead of flaked. It's a decorative situation. But then why would they go through the trouble of the back of it being a perfectly smooth, flat type object, right? Well, it's it probably has to do a lot with the architecture and the way that they do things that end up being uh, the bas relief type of architecture and artistic look. But there may be more to it than that. Also notice that right on this edge here, it's been back flaked just a little bit. So it makes this, sharp, this edge even sharper. So even though they did this to it, then they back flaked it. And so this was set up to do it that way. Some, some big guy that he can sit and talk to you and in five minutes make an arrowhead. And then after he does, he goes, well, that's this kind of arrowhead. I'd make other ones and stuff. And he knows how to make a few different kinds of arrowheads. And the dude's got a little piece of deer horn. And he's chipping it and doing it like in the old days. He starts out with a rock, just knocks a piece off and goes with it. So that's an oddity. So there's more to it than that, though. The backside of the ivory handle is the first part we should focus. And this is going to go to part two, guys. Uh, because I figured I should be about 20 minutes here and I'm at 33 and there's no way I can talk faster and quit adding on so It will be in your top left hand corner when it happens So in the center of the back side of the ivory handle as, as it were in the center There's a raised knob through which a cord could be inserted and carry the knife dominating the elaborate carved scene is the so-called master of beasts or master of animals and it's a symbol that frequently appears in Mesopotamian art. Scholars sometimes identify this figure as the Mesopotamian god El. Ding. The figure is displayed in unusual Mesopotamian style and clothing flanked by two prancing lions and a variety of different animals, while it is correct to use the term Mesopotamian, a more precise description of the style is Sumerian. It is likely the figure is not actually L, but some uh, 
Sumerian king of Uruk. And so maybe instead of the Gebel Erak knife, you should just change A to use, and it would be the Gebel Uruk knife. Wearing the traditional symbol of his kingship, a shepherd's cap. The other side of the Gebel Erak knife was a different scene, a tiered depiction of warfare. Two groups of soldiers battle it out in these scenes. The men with shave heads are most likely Sumerians, while the long-haired men are the Egyptians. All are naked except for their penis sheaths or penis coverings and simplistic things except for that guy. He's like dressed up like a Sumerian priest king. Right? This battle scene is also one of the first depictions of naval warfare in the world. Battleships are depicted in action. And so here we can see this side of it. Oh, one thing I didn't mention already is that they have this little carving over the scene here and left somewhat of the thickness here so it has this little little pommel hilt, little handle thing too, and an extra. But what's been carved into that is that mace. And you see this person perhaps in the one of the earliest depictions of a smiting type pose and standing there. And this doesn't appear to be exactly the Orion pose necessarily. But yet it has that same caricature. He's holding on to somebody who has his arms behind his back, which becomes something that's in the Egyptian iconography all the way through that's kept there. And it's ba he's bound. And again, he's shave-headed. And there's that long-haired Egyptians back in the day. And oh, a lot of them are blonde-haired and stuff, and red-haired and stuff too. They're, I've showed a bunch of other videos where they show the earliest statues they have or people that are blue-eyed too and we notice if we look at the Sumerians gods and all their statues and things they have blue eyes in them too and who they were now that we found genetics and everything we can make a clear understanding why of course that is too but uh then we have a guys that are fighting here hand to hand but he's sneaking up under the bottom with a knife or something and uh, almost looks like a banana or it could be a double bladed knife whoa Jedi at the time well it's a little bit smaller but Hmm, so we can see that, and long hair versus short hair, it's the hippies versus the skinheads. <laughs> so you have these Sumerians here. Just going to let that roll around for a second. So here we are smiting it again. And appears to be grabbing a guy by his hair. In fact, it looks like his hand's around his hair. You can kind of make that out. And uh, <clears throat> over and above that, there's a piece of wood that's behind him. So the guy behind him is striking one guy. And there's another one on the side of him striking. We're missing his head. But surely the little blotchy area here would have been a long-haired Egyptian. Skinheads are attacking him and beating him up, right? <laughs> If we go down just a little bit, though, we can see the top parts of these boats and the stanzas that were there and the skinheads that are on the boat. And there's funny little pine cone things that are on the very tip of the prow of a boat, which would have later have Viking dragons on them and things, and the Phoenicians have them on there there. But this looks kind of symbolic, almost looks like a little ice cream cone. But then you can see this crescent moon and this, which may have been a cross and lost the piece into it, or just a straight stanza through. There's something that looks like it up here. and Somebody tried to call that a trident before, but that looks off-circled somewhat. There's like a little fleck that's left there, and it looks like that's supposed to be part of the boat that's coming up from here and is not supposed to be contained within. I'd love for it to be trident, though. But then if we figure out who this was coming here and who they even clearly see who's coming here and at what age this was that would show you a correlation now there's a flood that comes later on the Sumerians there but there was tales of the one for four and that was the second one and so interjected when they come together there's still a, a flood tale and all these things that come out of it but it's a little different isn't it 
So under the influence of greater civilizations they go into. We're at 40 minutes now. I think I'll get through this part of it here and then we'll be able to go to part two at the next picture if I can make it. Now you're probably wondering if this is pre-dynastic Egyptian knife, why does it display a significant Mesopotamian and Sumerian style? Well, to answer this question, we need to understand the early relationships between Mesopotamia and early Egypt's earliest cultures. The trade relations, well, first of all, genetically, they're pretty much cousins with each other. And, of course, the Bible tells a story where they would be people of like that. So, there are, in mythology and tales, some truths to things, but... Trade relations apparently developed between the two as early as the 4th millennium B.C. with the Uruk period of the Mesopotamian civilization having significant influences on the emerging Nakata II culture. That is the key predecessor to the later Egyptian civilization. So after this point, they come into what we call Dynasty Zero somewhat. And then from there, we'll have what we know of as ancient Egypt. And people quite often study later periods instead of early, earliest periods, for sure. I've talked to a lot of people who know an extreme amount about Egypt and have studied it even, but this is not something they even knew about because it's not in the field of anything that they were into. <clears throat> and they weren't led this way or shown it in any way. <clears throat> During this period, there was an abundant trade between the region of Egypt and the Near East. Possible trade routes from Mesopotamia could have been fully by sea or by across land as well. Well, in my other video that talks about this exactly, in that series of pre-dynastic Egypt and its forming, I talk about how people have showed cave art of people getting pulled in a boat that looks just like that boat coming in and having a warfare. In fact, some of their tombs are right there in fact those people settled and who was that well that's part of the civilizations that make up the very first pre-dynastic Egyptians so it's it's almost like they had the thing going on right and then somebody showed up and goes look if you put this and this together BAM and it took it zoom to a whole new heights and stuff and it took a while to get that engine really humming, too. People say, blah, 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 like you're saying, here's a thousand years here before the pyramids. So people quite often look at it like I say all the time, you know, just somebody threw a little bean out there and all of a sudden, boom, like popcorn, it popped up or jacking the beanstalk and everything. And it's like, it didn't quite work like that. In fact, what we need to find out is those didn't quite work like that. And where did that come from? This leads us back to another level, to another level. People get trapped in points. <clears throat> so, during that period, there was abundant trade between the region and that it's possible trade routes from Mesopotamia could have been fully by sea or across land as well. And, and I say yes. In fact, we look at how languages emerge and you can see cuneiform wraps around it and into Egypt and they're all using it and stuff. And from the ancient people have... Hati and Hutusha, the Hurrians and stuff that were there, Matani, and all of these people that connect the Fertile Crescent together, but that's really just running up that same Tigris and Euphrates that contains the land of Eden, as they even called it, by the Sumerians. We're about to go to it in a minute and see if I can catch one more paragraph. This period holds significance as well as a major stage in Egyptian development under the influence of the more advanced Mesopotamia. It is during this stage that the major parallels between the two occurred and the proto-literacy entered Egypt. The Mesopotamian influence on pre-dynastic Egypt lasted for roughly 250 years until the emergence of Dynasty I and the more fleshed out unique Egyptian art and cultural style. So. Part two is coming up in your top left hand corner and I'll try to start it off with a firework if I can and or a little spark and a piff and I know there's one coming up here and we'll see you there it's top left hand corner. Leave a comment before we go. Peace.